Hello, live again with Philosophy Roulette number 133, where we get philosophy and read and review it live on air, which is cool. Something to fill up the pandemic. So this morning we were doing a uh, paper from Logic and Analysis, or Logic and Analysis, whatever, however you say French, I wish I knew. But before that we had run into this uh, Sonic Pictures, and you know, it was uh, available. It was, uh, let's see... What did I say? It was 22 pages, but, you know, with at least, at least a decent amount of spacing between the words. I was like, you know what? This should be fine, too. So let's go grab this one, and then we can just start right off, because I had left it here from uh, this morning. And, uh, cool. So, as always, if you join me live, you can grab the paper by typing exclamation point paper in the chat box, or it'll be... A link will be in the show notes be below the uh, video if you're watching this later on the YouTubes or, for that matter, um, on the Twitches in the description. I've really been watching a lot of Twitch uh, lately, too. I mean, I guess uh, been... Diablo 2 is a great game. It may be one of the better games ever made, frankly, and you're watching some of these professionals now at it who just, this is all they do, they stream Diablo 2, basically. It's uh, so much fun. <laughs> it really is. So. But yes, I stream academic philosophy papers because, you know, that is, like, super cool. I also stream Minesweeper sometimes. Someone asked me the other day if I'm a professional Minesweeper streamer. There are literally like two people streaming Minesweeper. Like that's the most I've ever seen streaming it. I was like, there are no professional Minesweeper streamers. <laughs> so it's not something people actually do. Maybe if y'all decide you want to pay me lots of money to play Minesweeper, I will get back into it. Okay, so this is Sonic Pictures by Jason Lettington, and it was a winning essay. So that's why I was like, oh, look at that. Why not read something that won something? Of course, I don't know. Maybe it's winning for some bad reason, but I doubt it. Okay, so in Antithetical Arts, Peter Kivy explains how absolute music, an art of purely abstract but perhaps expressive sound, poses a distinctive problem for philosophy of art. Purely abstract but perhaps expressive, so possibly expressive expressive and purely abstract so necessarily abstract and possibly expressive but it still counts as art so it's still art of some sort all of the other fine arts are for the most part arts with literary or representational content and that content plays a major role in accounting for what it is in these arts that gives us such deep and abiding satisfaction but absolute music does not possess such content so it is possible so it is a puzzle as to what it is in our absolute, or what it is in or absolute mag, uh, or about absolute music gives what appears at least to be the same kind of deep satisfaction that other arts, the arts with content, give. That is, in brief, it is the problem of absolute music. So I guess you can abstract away farther in music is the claim than in other arts. So there's something less representational about it, and therefore, what is it that is so far away? Okay, or you know, what is still so uh, appealing about it. Okay, one obvious solution to the problem, popular both in philosophical and musical theoretical circles, uh, quoting somebody here, is to contest appearances and to deny that absolute music does indeed want, li want for literary representational content. I right, so just deny the premise. Following arch, arch formalist, Following arch formalist Edward Hanslick, Kiwi thinks such views are hopeless. Instead, he insists that a fully satisfactory account of the artistic and aesthetic satisfactions of music alone must and can give, be given without appeal to any sort of literary or representational content. In this respect, literature and absolute music are indeed antithetical arts. Okay, so, because literature has to be some sort of representational and absolute music does not, so that makes them antithetical. However, the same cannot be said of music in general. Despite his formalism, Kivy is deeply sensitive to the representational potential of music, which he explores at length in Sound and Semblance and Osmond's Rage. Focusing primarily on program music and opera, Kivy argues that there are many cases in which full appreciation of work or performance requires attention to the music's representational features. But more controversially, against Roger Scruton, Jennifer Robinson 
Robinson and Stephen Davies Kivy claims that in rare cases, music like painting can actually provide pictorial experience. This is my topic here. However, my concern is not the possibility of musical painting. Picturing, I believe that Kivy's argument includes his replies to Scruton, Robeson, and Davies, Davies, Robinson, I guess. Why do I keep saying Robeson? Robeson and Davies conclusively establish it. Instead, my goal is to build on Kivy's work to develop a concept of musical pictures, or more generally, sonic pictures, that is sensitive to recent develops in philosophy of perception. As it turns out, Kivy's approach to sonic pictures embeds a commitment to a metaphysical metaphysics of sound and hearing that significantly restricts the scope of what can be sonically pictured, and recent work in philosophy of perception suggests that we have good reason to question this commitment and the restriction it entails. In this place, I'll recommend a view of sound and hearing that yields a considerably more powerful conception of sonic picturing. Um, let's see. There is, I do know of one thing, um, in this area. I, I don't, I know of it, I don't know it. Um, there was a guy, Aaron Guter, maybe, um, doing work on, uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy of music and how there's a, uh, yeah, something along those lines and how there's some sort of a, uh, scale that you can put to like musical uh, to, to sound or something so that I mean so that would put it in sort of like a visual representation okay but like that might be the limit of what I remember about it but I could look it up the art article is in four parts. Part one presents Kivy's view of sonic pictures, exposes its metaphysical commitments, and identifies two ways to resist them. Part two introduces five contemporary views that reject the metaphysical basis of Kivy's restriction on sonic picturing and presents an argument in favor of my preferred view. Part three then introduces, in response to a musically motivated objection originally developed by Roger Scruton, which insists that reflecting on musical listening should lead us to prefer something like Kivy's view of sounds. Finally, part four explain, explores the view of sonic picturing entailed by the metaphysics of sounds and hearing that I recommend. Among other things, I'll argue that audio tracks on film and two contemporary musical genres, beatboxing and cover songs, are best in, understood in terms of sonic picturing. I've been getting more and more annoyed at these, uh, and this, again, as I always say, it has nothing to do with this uh, author here. This sort of uh, index that has been uh, that everyone's putting at the end of their like introduction section, like I've been reading a lot of papers, I, I just my eyes gloss over when I when I see these things though. Every time now, it's like I don't care about you describing your paper. I just want to get to the content. So I mean, I know that most people aren't reading a random philosophy paper twice a day, six days a week. I know that, <laughs> but it, it, like maybe it helps people who are doing it rare, uh, randomly. But who the heck is really re reading uh, your work if they don't have some idea what's going on or they're crazy like me? So, I'm just, uh, why is there an index paragraph? I just don't know at the moment. But maybe I'll figure it out one day. Kivy on musical pictures and the nature of sound. In exploring the representational capacity of music, Kivy distinguishes pictorial from structural representations. In the latter, a structural element in music corresponds with something extra musical, such as a feature of the accompanying text that the structure, so to say, ana analogizes. For example, according to Kivy, the resolution to D major at the end of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro structurally represents the resolving of, a, of differences among the couples. But while the informed listener may appreciate this representational function, there is, Kivy notes, no question of simply hearing conjugal harmony in the music. There is nothing to hear in the music because the music in these instances does not represent sound or sound events, but abstract concepts and things that seem and things seen but not heard. One hears the musical structure, understands the text, and perceives cogni cognizes the structural analogy. By contrast, Roger Wolheim, following Roger Wolheim, Kiwi treats a representation as pictorial just in case it allows us to perceive the object of representation in the representation itself. This notion of picturing is sense modality independent and extends in principle beyond the visual. Thus, Kiwi writes, now, visual pictorial representations represent what is seen. We see the moon in the Mona Lisa. Likewise, pictorial representations of music, if indeed there are any, represent what is heard. We hear the music whatever it pictorially represents. So it seems clear that pictorial representations, if any, in music must be representations of sounds. This does not mean music cannot represent other things besides sounds or paintings 
painting things other than sight, but they can't represent them pictorially. All right, so I'm already a little uh, confused by the uh, terminology here, and maybe with what exactly the analogy is too, because when we see the Mona Lisa, we're looking at paint. We're not looking at an actual woman Mona Lisa. Um, of course, it was made of different materials. If it was an actual person, they're not made of paint, at least not that I know of. So when we look at the Mona Lisa, we see the Mona, we see Mona Lisa, but we're looking at paint. And so when we hear a something going on representationally in music, we hear that, but it's made up of the sonic uh, waves and the sound waves. I guess, just like the picture is made of paint, the music's made of sound waves. So, I'm a little confused, like, why is it pictorial? It's, um, it's still representing something, but why are we using the pictorial analogy here? And, um, it's not that music re represents other things besides sounds any more than paintings represent, don't represent other things besides paint. They usually almost always represent something other than paint. It's a uh, very rare that the, I mean it'd be a very small section of things that in which a painting represents paint. Um, so I'm a little this sort of seems I'm just not quite like I know this is my ignorance of the topic, but just from the straightforward and analogous sort of uh, situation, it doesn't seem to line up exactly right here. Okay, but I don't. Uh, that said, I don't think this is my objection right there has anything to do with what's going on. It's just I'm a little confused as to why it got, it's sort of like we inherited this sort of analogy. Okay, call the view that pictorial representations, if any, in music can be representations of sounds. Kivy's restriction. Yeah, okay, fine. Pictor so that's not the way I would say it, but it's completely reasonable. Kivy's restriction is grounded in a view of sounds and hearing that Kivy infrequently articulates and to my knowledge never defends. It is view with rich philosophical pedigree, it is a view in an A in there, and it is shared by Kivy's main opponent on issues of musical representation, Roger Scruton. I return to it in a moment, first though a bit more about Kivy's view of musical pictures. <laughs> Kivy divides pictorial representations into two basic categories. Aided and, un aided and unaided. An aided pictorial representation is a picture accompanied by words that tell us it is a picture and without which we would have probably failed to recognize it as such. By contrast, we experience unaided pictorial representation as pictures and can't perceive their subjects in them without having to be told that they are pictures. Kivy writes, Anyone can see the woman's face in the Mona Lisa without being told that it is a portrait of a lady. But there's a beautiful painting by the British artist J.M.W. Turner in which we can see a sunset in the painting only if we know the title, Sunset Over a Lake. Without the words, there would be no seeing in, only the impression of a non-representational color composition. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you need a prompting to understand what's going on, which is fair. And um, there's no difference, I guess, between music and uh, paint in that case. In the case of visual art, the aided pictorial representation is the exception, but according to Kibbe, in music, it's the rule. He claims that the that examples of aided musical pictures abound, but it's hard to come up with any real incontestable examples. Uh, the aided musical pictures abound uh, of the unaided type. Even the most obvious cases of musical picturing in the Western classical tradition, namely representations of bird calls in compositions such as Beethoven's Sixth Symphony are generally flagged by such titles and other accompanying texts. In fact, Kivy claims it is probably best to give up the point and admit that unaided pictorial representation in music is, if possible at all, too rare a phenomenon to be counted as belonging to music's repertoire of aesthetic possibilities. I think it is understandable that Kivy would arrive at this conclusion given his focus on classical mu music. However, in part four, I'll argue that unaided musical picturing is both more common and more aesthetically significant than Kivy admits. You know, I think that's, I mean, I, I understand where Kivy's coming from. Um, what is that, Appalachian Spring? It's just like, I don't know if, who my audience is listening to this, but it's this very famous um, composition by an American composer. And it turns out I found out much later after hearing and you it's just like you can like sort of picture yourself in a far like i'm like i'm not far out from appalachia here in new york and like we got i was a uh, gone hiking in the past so you go there it's like you can just like sort of feel being in like a spring forest when you hear this music turns out it had nothing to do with that the title was suggested after it was done by i think uh 
like a uh, Martha Graham or some other uh, like a dance uh, a famous dance uh, choreographer or something but it had nothing to do with the composer um, he just was like I have this thing I don't know what to call it she goes why don't you call it like Appalachian Springs what remi reminds me of and he was like oh that's a great title so it's like this, even the this is the song in my head that I had like completely associated with Appalachian Spring and it had it had nothing to do with Appalachian Spring when it was being composed so yeah that's just an aside while Kibbe seemed interested only in musical pictures he clearly intends his account to generalize to sonic pictures as such thus Kibbe's restriction in full generality is the view that sonic pictures musical or otherwise must be pictures of sounds now I've said that this embeds non-trivial metaphysical commitments how so? Well, in general, pictures represent what they do, in part by representing perceptual experiences shared by their objects. What makes a Rembrandt self-portrait a picture of Rembrandt is, in part, the portrait that the portrait shares enough of Rembrandt's visual appearance. This, above all, is what enables us to see Rembrandt in the picture. Any satisfactory theory of depiction must offer an account of exactly how, and in what, in what sense, pictures capture the perceptual appearances of the objects they depict. But the point here is that only things that perceptual appear, that is, things that have perceptual appearances, can be pictured at all. Um, I don't know. People say they make pictures of concepts all the time. I don't know if that's... I mean, they say they do. It might be different. So maybe Hopkins says something like that. Assuming they're using the CF in the correct way. At the same time, it seems that whatever perceptually appears in some is something that can, in principle, be pictured. In sum, then, for sense modality M, an object O might be perceived in an M-type pictorial representation if and only if O has M-type perceptual appearances. For example, many ordinary objects and events, cabbages, cats, clouds, anything beginning with C apparently, have visual appearances. Thus, they might see, be seen in visual pictorial representations, that is, they might be visually pictured. Similarly, anything with auditory appearances will be a candidate for sonic picturing, for being heard in sonic pictures. Consequently, Kibbe's restriction that sonic, sonic pictures must be pictures of sounds holds only if auditory appearances belong only to sounds. The view that auditory experiences, auditory appearances, yeah, so, so I think I was saying experiences, auditory exp appearances belong only to sounds. The view that auditory appearances belong only to sounds is a piece of our collective empiricist inheritance. As such, it easily masquerades as philosophical common sense. Consider the following exchange, which occurs in early in the first of Berkeley's three dialogues. Philonia, Philonus. This point then is agreed between us that sense sensible things are those only which are immediately perceived by the sense you will farther inform me whether we immediately perceive by sight anything besides light and color and figures or by hearing anything but sounds by the palate anything besides taste by the smell besides odors or by the touch more than tangible qualities hylas we do not in short we immediately or directly perceive only sensible qualities which Philonus goes on to argue exist only insofar as they are perceived such a view receives little support from contemporary philosophers. It is widely agreed that what we immediately perceive are not mind-dependent qualities, but mind-independent objects. In particular, what we immediately see and touch are supposed to be ordinary objects such as horses and tomatoes. This is not to... Do you actually touch horses and tomatoes? I haven't touched a horse in a long time. This is not to deny that we see colors and shapes. It is to deny that we see the horse by or in virtue of seeing its color or shape. Our visual experience of the horse is not mediated by the experience of its sensible properties. Similar considerations hold for touch and tomatoes, I take it. Yet the priority accorded to ordinary objects in visual and tactile perception is typically not extended to the other sense modalities. Yeah, there is a paper I saw, I downloaded, but I never got around to reading it's calling Smelling Objects, I believe. And so I, I suspect that uh, Smelling Objects is going to make a similar point to write something like this. Yeah, should get back to that. In the case of hearing, this manifests itself in two ways. First, philosophers typically follow Berkeley in taking the only direct or immediate objects of hearing to be sounds. On this view, when you witness a musical performance, you directly see the performers, performers but you directly hear only the sounds they make. Second, even if most philosophers reject the Berkeleyan view that sounds are mind <coughs> dependent qualities, there is still a tendency to think of sounds as independent of their material causes, as somehow hovering above or alongside the world of everyday material objects and events. 
Taking these two ideas together suggests that the only items that can show up in auditory consciousness and so bear auditory appearances are sounds. Thus, in listening to the musical performance, you may indirectly hear their hear the performers, their instruments, and their playing. But the only things that genuinely populate your auditory auditory consciousness are the sounds that they make. In this case, no musician, instrument, or act of playing has ever auditorily appeared to anyone. Yeah, I feel like is this how? Um, yeah, I guess maybe this is a common uh, view. I, I wouldn't have uh, agreed to this. I mean, I, I go with the phenomenologies that we always, uh, uh, the objects of, per of perception, including any smell or uh, sound are, um, like you hear the door closing, you don't hear the sounds, and then infer the door closed, you hear the door closing. So I would have not, um, I wouldn't have agreed to this sort of thing to begin with, but that's me, I don't count. Um, and that's why I wanted to read the smelling objects things. Do you smell flowers or do you smell a smell? And I think there might be some interesting stories there, but we're talking about the interesting story here, so I bet there's some interesting stuff coming. Okay, as we see in a moment, the trend in the philosophy of perception is to reject such a conservative view of auditory appearances, and this turns open and this in turn opens a door to a more powerful conception of auditory picturing, among other things. First, however, a key point. If sounds are the sole bearers of auditory appearances, then sounds must be individuals rather than sensible properties. Here's why. In general, bearers of a, property, of a particular sensible property have the corresponding sensory appearance in virtue of bearing that property. For example, all red things have visual appearance, a certain look, in virtue of being red. Excuse me. So if sounds are audible properties, then their bearers have corresponding auditory appearances. Furthermore, if sounds are audible properties, and then there are presumably born, they are presumably born by non-sounds, whether objects or s objects, events, spaci spatio-temporal regions, or spatio-temporal regions, I guess, etc. Whatever they are born by. Thus, if sounds are audible properties, then some non-sounds have audible auditory experience appearances. Conversely, if no non-sounds have auditory appearances, that is. If only sounds have auditory appearances, then sounds cannot be properties, they must be individuals. In sum, we have A. Kiwi's restriction is true if and only if only sounds have auditory appearances. B. If only sounds have auditory appearances, then sounds are individuals. To resist Kiwi's restriction, we must uh, above all resist the idea that only sounds have auditory appearances. There are two ways to do this. First, we might accept that sounds are individuals, but insist that some non-sounds nevertheless have auditory appearances. Second, we might reject the view that sounds are individuals in favor of a view of sounds as sensible properties. In part two, I consider both of these strategies and offer independent reasons in favor of the latter. Okay. Okie doke. see where this is going. 2. Resisting Kivy's restriction. To resist Kivy's restriction, an individualist about sounds must allow that some non-sounds have auditory appearances. Here four, contemporary views seem, here, four contemporary views seem promising. First, according to Parthood, sounds are events, disturbings of media, that are proper parts of their medium involving event sources. For example, when a baseball collides with a bat, the sound, the disturbing of the air, is a property of its source, the ball bat collision in air. Given that sounds have audible features, parthood entails that some non sounds, namely sound sources, have parts with audible features, so auditory appearances according to no, appearances, period. According to O'Callaghan, this allows us to explain an important phenomenological datum, namely that we can hear sound sources along with their sounds in such a way that the audible source and the audible sound are not simply phenomenologically unified, they share an audible appearance. Thus, Partridge seems to permit some non-sounds to appear auditorily. Okay, that's fine. It seems all right. Second, identity. Identity holds that sounds are identical with their event sources. When the ball collides with the bat, the collision is the sound, and so a bearer of audible features such as pitch and loudness. This means that ordinary noise events such as collisions have auditory appearances. Strictly speaking, this view is compatible with Kivy's restriction, since the identity theorist can hold that all and only sounds have auditory appearances. At the same time, by identify sound, identifying sounds with their ordinary event sources, identity locates auditory appearances in, the in a manner at odds with the spirit of Kivy's restriction. Contra Kivy, 
identity holds that any noise event has auditory appearances and so is a possible object of musical picturing. In this respect, identity, the identity theorists can offer officially embrace Kirby's restriction, even while massively extending the scope of what we might what might be auditorily and so musically pictured. Yeah, so a lot of things are musically uh, have musical pictures then I guess. Auditory pictures. Third, according to plurality, audible qualities such as pitch and loudness can be borne both by noisy everyday events like collisions and sounds understood as pure audibilia. That is a that is a metaphysical individual somehow independent of events and objects that we can see or touch. By denying that sound alone bear audible qualities and so auditory appearances, plurality is straightforwardly incompatible with Kibbe's restriction. Okay. Finally, according to abstract, sounds are repeatable or abstract individuals. On this view, sound, sounds resemble properties or universals in virtue of the fact that they can be spatially and temporally multiply located. The idea is that sounds are more like letters or words than ordinary material objects or events. Just as the inscription tick, tick, tick repeats the same linguistic individual, individual namely the word tick, the ticking clock re presents the same sonic individual, namely the ticking sound, at regular intervals. Proponents of this view argue that despite being property-like, sounds are not properties, especially because A, we talk about sounds as if they're individuals, and B, unlike properties, sounds are in various ways separable from their material sources. However, as discussed in part one, the idea that sounds are separable from or float off their material sources readily suggests that auditory appearances belong to sound alone. Nevertheless, Matthew Nudds has recently argued at length that even someone who endorses abstracta can and should accept that sometimes material events themselves are apparent to us in auditory experience. If his argument is successful, then even abstracta might provide the means to, with which to resist Kiri's restriction. All four of these views, parthood, identity, plurality, and abstracta, insist that sounds are individuals. To this extent, they remain co compatible with Kiri's restriction. But inasmuch as they, as they more widely distribute auditory appearances, they provide means to resist it. Even among philosophers who treat sounds as individuals, there is a growing consensus that, in one way or another, ordinary noisy events, such as collisions, can genuinely appear in auditory consciousness. In this respect, the trend is to say that what we hear, strictly speaking, are not just sounds, but their sources, the ordinary noisy event that populate our surroundings. This suggests a more direct route to resisting Kivy's restriction. Okay. Right. Property holds that sounds are audible properties of their event sources. Noisy events such as collisions and vibrations can be described as bearing audible qualities such as pitch, timbre, and loudness. According to property, those audible qualities constitute the sound of the event. In, in other words, sounds are event-born auditory quality complexes. Okay, This keeps with the philosophical tradition by classing sounds alongside colors among the sensible qualities. However, tradition also treats sounds, like canonical colors, as properties of objects. So by taking sounds for properties of events, property breaks with tradition. In any case, because an object's perceptible qualities do not mediate a perceptual contact with it, property has the following critical consequence. Just as we see objects in, but not by or in virtue of, seeing their colors, so we hear the event sources of sounds in, but not by or in virtue of, hearing their sounds. And just as the primary objects of vision are not colors per se, but color-bearing objects, the primary objects of hearing are not sounds per se, but sound-bearing events. In other words, according to property, we never hear mere noise, only noisy events, and the primary bearers of auditory appearance are not sounds, but their event sources. So. Yay! You don't hear the noise, you hear the door slam. Yay! <laughs> yeah, okay. So far, then, we have five ways to resist Kivy's restriction. These views differ significantly, and we should expect that they will have different consequences for the scope and nature of auditory picturing. But which should we prefer? I have argued elsewhere that considerations of theoretical simplicity, both ontological and syntactic, give us reason to prefer property to both parthood and identity. I think similar considerations tell against plurality and abstractive. Like property, plurality recognizes the primary objects of hearing include own ordinary events bearing auditory qualities such as pitch, timber, and loudness. But while, excuse me, but while property stops there, plurality also insists, along with abstractive, on the existence of pure audibilia. 
that is objects of audition that float free of material sources. These, they say, are sounds. But I see no reason to recognize the existence of such things and other things being equal, we should prefer a view that dispenses with them. Of course, proponents of pure audibilia argue that we nevertheless have reason to recognize the existence of such objects. While fully adjudicating this issue is beyond the scope of this paper, I turn in part three to one of the most important arguments that have led philosophers to, the, to this separability thesis, Roger Scruton's argument from acoust acousmatic experience. Okay, so we got a table here. Um, let's see, what does this say? Primary objects of hearing are, these all say sounds, and, and property says events with audible qualities. Sounds are proper parts of their event sources. Identity says uh, identical with their event sources. Plurality says pure abstracta, so these are these audibilia thing, metaphysical things. And then property says audible quality, complex is born by events. So it's like you have, it's not a proper part of the event, but you have a quality, a uh, property of the event. So it's not a proper part, but it's a property. So it seems kind of similar to this one, except you don't have the partridge problem, as they were mentioning above. Because why? Um, simplicity. Uh, yeah, because you have the sound stuff versus the event, and just you then you just have events and properties. In this one, you have multiple things, I guess, is the argument. And this one has like metaphysical things, which doesn't even, uh, so you have to postulate even something newer and bigger. All right, Scruton's argument from a kousmatic experience. When discussing whether music can represent everyday objects and events, such as a quarrel or a forest fire, Scruton writes that, a sound is an individual detachable from the object that emits it and is capable of independent existence. However, it is the sound, not the object, that appears in the music. How then can the music represent the subjects such as quarrels that are normally ascribed to it when those subjects share no appearance with the music? <laughs> yeah, well, what is to have an appearance? That's a different problem. Okay. According to Scruton, it cannot. As we've seen, Kibbe's answer is more circumspect. The music cannot represent things pictorially, only structurally. Yet beneath this disagreement lies a shared view of the nature of sounds as self-standing objects of perception and the sole bearers of auditory appearances. Despite the many differences that this is a significant alignment, despite their many differences, this is a significant alignment and the source of Kivy's conviction that sounds alone can be musically pictured. My aim in this section is to undercut the temptation to this view, which I think is easily felt when reflecting on the experience of listening to music. At the heart of Scruton's philosophy of music is the idea that it is possible to perceptually attend to sounds without attending to their sources. Such, such abstract listening yields what he calls acousmatic experience, Along with Casey O'Callaghan and Michael Martin, Scruton thinks the possibility of kousmatic experience suggests an independence of sound and sources at, incompatible with treating sounds as properties. He writes, Sounds can be detached completely from their source, as by radio or gramophone. When was he writing that there was a gramophone? Interesting. I mean, maybe he was just being a throwback. I have no idea. Uh, sounds can be detached completely from their source as by radio or gramophone and listened to in isolation. This experience, the acousmatic experience of sound, it removes nothing that is essential to the sound as an object of attention. The striking thing is that the sounds, thus emancipated from their causes and experienced as independent but related objects for, which form coherent complexes with boundaries and simultaneous parts, simultaneities, parts, and wholes. Now, if particular sounds can be detached completely from their sources, then it is hard to see how they could be sensible parts of their sources, as I suggest. Sensible properties cannot be detached from their bearers. Thus, if particular sounds can be detached completely from their sources, then my view is in trouble. Yet, it seems odd to say that listening to a recording of a musical performance involves listening to sounds that have been taxed or emancipated from their sources. The fact that you can capture the sound of a musical performance and play it back no more shows that sounds can be detached from their sources than the fact that you can capture the color and shape of a flower in a photograph shows color and shape can be taxed from the flower. Still, it may be easier to listen acousmatically when hearing music played over an audio system than when witnessing a live performance. On the other hand, listening to a musical recording hardly guarantees an acousmatic experience. An audiophile or sound engineer might attend to the music and, at the same time, how, to, how the speakers sound. A guitarist might marvel at the warmth of West, Mon West Montgomery's guitar. And if you listen to Glenn Gould play, 
get when Google play, play Box Goldberg variations, you might find yourself annoyingly distracted by his humming, hardly an acousmatic experience. So uh, hearing a musical record recording played over an audio system does not prevent the listener from attending to the sources of the sounds that she hears. Nevertheless, Scruton's main point seems that when we do listen acousmatically, we experience sounds as individuals that form coherent complexes with boundaries and simultaneities, parts, and wholes. And I think that there is something to this. It does not, however, tell against property. Yeah, so this see, the argument here, I guess, is this listening acousmatically has more to do with how we approach the sounds, not the sounds themselves or the music itself, which is fair. Okay, here's why. Exactly the same sort of experience is possible not only with color, but also with shape. Take color. Certain forms of abstract visual art, such as color field paintings and abstract film, encourage the viewer to visually attend to expenses of color without attending to their bearers. In viewing such work, colors may seem to float free of the objects that bear them and appear as individuals that form coherent complexes with boundaries and simultaneities, parts, and wholes. This does not, of course, tell against a view that colors are properties rather than individuals. That something can be an independent object of attention is no reason to think that it is an object. And that you can attend to A without attending to B does not show that A is independent of or separable from B. It shows only that A and B are not identical. That, of course, a property of instance, a property instance is not identical to its bearer. So to consider shape. In a well-known technique of for teaching figure drawing, students are asked to attend to the shape of objects while ignoring their identity. It is easier to draw the shape of a nose than to draw a nose. Students accomplish this by attending to the negative space defined by the contours of the nose, and so attentionally, but only attentionally, detach the shape of the nose from the nose itself. Yeah, so it's something that we are doing, not inherently part of the thing. In sum, then, the possibility of charismatic experience does not tell against the property view of sounds. Property holds that sounds are distinct, though not separate or separable from their sources, and this is sufficient to underwrite the possibility of a, a charismatic experience. However, even if the possibility of a charismatic experience does not tell against property view, there appears to be an important difference between abstract listening and abstract visual experience of color or shape. As Kivy notes in Music Alone, it seems significantly easier to intentionally abstract a sound from its source than color or shape from its bearer. This demands explanation. P possibly it indicates that sounds are individuals rather than properties as intentionally isolated as, as, as intentionally isolating a particular is plausibly easier than intentionally isolating a property. But there is an alternative. We can explain the relative ease of abstracting of abstract listening without appeal to a particular metaphysics of sound, namely as a consequence of the relative epistemic property of audition. The relative epistemic pro poverty of audition. The relative epistemic poverty of audition. Okay. The relative epistemic poverty of audition cons consists in the fact that typically we know on a purely auditory basis about what we hear is substantially less than what we know on a purely visual basis about what we see. In, a, in particular, hearing often leaves us unsure exactly what we have heard, which would seem to make it easier, in Martin Heidegger's words, listen away from things, divert our ear from them, that is, listen abstractly. On this view, the epistemology of hearing, not the metaphysics of sounds, ex explains why. The ear, far more than the eye, is capable of sustained perceiving in an abstract, non-interpretive mode. Okay, so that's interesting. They're claiming this is not metaphysically based, it's epistem epistemologically different. Um, why? Because the ear is attuned to more general things than the eye is. The eye is doing things differently. That's kind of an odd thing. Um, perceiving an abstract non-interpretive mode. Um, why? Just because we are more used to doing it? It would seem very strange, really, that our different senses are metaphysically different, too. Um, or, like, we are hooked up metaphysically different. Um, I wonder how much weight is going to get put on this, just because it's such an... Uh, I find this to be a very strange uh, claim that, like... What you, it's the epistemology of this stuff. Um, epistemic poverty. Well, I would say that it's not poverty, but granularity, maybe. Like, we have a very particular um, 
refined uh, visual ca capability, which gives the interest of the ability to distinguish way more things uh, visually than we, I guess we could say auditorily. Um, so the granularity of the sense, I would say, is really here. I wouldn't call this an epistemic poverty. I'd say a perceptual granularity. Um, I mean, in that sense, I'm on board with this, but I, I just don't, there's a lot of, I mean, the background baggage with epistemology and metaphysics here. So it m mainly just scares me is what I'm saying. Th this sort of metaphysics and epistemology here is just very scary. Yeah, I mean, if I'm just gonna say perceptual granularity, then it seems pretty reasonable. Okay, so that's how I understand this. But how exactly does relative epistemic poverty entail relative ease of abstract perceiving? My hypothesis is that vision's epistemic richness improves a cognitive and attentional burden that interferes with abstract perception of properties such as color and shape. In ordinary circumstances, when you open your eyes, not only is there a great deal to notice, there's a great deal that you, are involu you involuntarily do notice. For example, in looking at the tomato before you, you visually notice not only that it is a tomato, with a certain color, but also that it has a particular shape and size that is lying on a per particular surface, excuse me, casting a certain shadow, and so on. You also visually notice a great deal about the surrounding space. You notice all of this as a matter of course without any particular effort, and you cannot help but not notice most of it. The fundamental passivity of most perceptual recognition is frequently overlooked, but helps to explain the relative difficulty of abstract seeing. The bare visual pres presence of the tomato passively activates a host of visual recognition recognitive capacities, the result is that you automatically see the redness of the tomato as the color of a particular item in a complex scene. This way of experiencing the color of the tomato is foisted on you, and it will compete with any attempt compete with any attempt to see that color abstractly. The result is a kind of cognitive tug of war between involuntary and visual recognition and attentional abstraction. You see, yeah, this I don't agree with this sort of account here. I'd just say this is the phenomenology where you see the tomato and then you have to sort of abstract away to get to the color. Now, if you want to cash that out in some sort of tug of war between involuntary vi visual recognition and uh, attentional abstraction, um, I find that as a uh, in contrast to the phenomenological picture, which I thought was being presented here. So that, or it's just making the phenomenology redundant. Well, one of them is going to be redundant. So I, I, this, uh, I think the author should have doubled down here, not done this epistemology thing. I mean, it doesn't cause any problems, but I just, uh, yeah, I think a double down of the phenomenology would have been better. Okay. If this hypothesis is correct, then it should be possible to facilitate attentional abstraction by reducing the number of perceptual rec recognitive capacities passively ac activated by an experience. Indeed, as it turns out, attentional abstracting the color of the tomato seems easier if we take up most of your field of view or if you visually simplify the rest of the scene. For example, you might place a tomato alone on a white tabletop or better deploy a visually neutral screen to obscure everything but a blemish-free patch of tomato surface. Apparently such strat strategies work because they reduce cognitive load, abstract perception is cognitively demanding, and the degree to which we cannot help but see the redness as the color of one particular object among others. Yeah, but you see right here, it's like if you can't see anything except a little patch of red on the tomato, then you're not seeing the tomato anymore. You're seeing a patch because that's what you cut everything out because there ain't no more tomato. It's like saying, well, I can only see this through this little hole and you couldn't even tell there was a tomato there. So it just seems, uh, like I said, I'm still not disagreeing with the author, but it's like it seems like they're uh, re, um, recapitulating their uh, metaphysics here. All right. The phenomenon cu cuts across sense modalities. Some concert goers shut their eyes to better attend to the music alone. Reducing extraneous perceptual recognition facilitates the intended attentional abstraction. Here the key point is that in normal cases of pure auditory experience, there is relatively little to notice. Arguably, on shutting your eyes in the concert hall, you cannot help but auditorily notice that a piano is being played somewhere in front of you, but provided that the qu hall is quiet, this hardly compares to the wealth of perceptual noticing that automatically accompanies an ordinary visual experience. The vast majority of what is perceptually noticed in a purely auditory experience of musical performance is about the sound itself, and this is all we need to explain the relative ease of abstract listening. While the details of this account require further development, this is just one approach to explaining the relative ease of abstract listening by appealing to epistemic features of audition rather than to the metaphysics of sound. In fact, Kivy himself offers another such explanation based on the 
idea that thanks to epistemic richness, vision has greater survival value than hearing. Um, yeah, you can do that too. Whether you accept my argument or prefer Kirby's explanation is irrelevant. The key is that there is no easy inference from the relative ease of abstract listening to the claim that sounds are individuals rather than properties. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the argument overall. It's just, uh, see, I was going, see, this was um, another explanation of epistemic richness, survival value. So this is some evolutionary scientific one. This is a cognitive load argument, and I will have doubled down on the metaphysics. So different strategies, but I guess if, as long as they end up in the right place, it doesn't matter. In some then, the phenomenon of a kousmatic experience gives us no reason to accept objects of hearing can float free of material processes as both plurality and abstract are required. While I cannot fully settle this issue here, there are other arguments to consider. Scruton's argument is one of a class of arguments that seeks to draw radical metaphysical conclusions from features of auditory experience that can be neatly explained in other ways. As such, these arguments are all quite weak. They certainly should not embarrass anyone who aspires to give a full account of auditory phenomena by appeals to no more than ordinary noisy events and their audible qualities, just as property insists. <coughs> okay. I'm getting there. Almost done. Mostly done, at least. From sound in sound, from sound in sound to event in event. What? Uh, this is one of these, like, it depends whether you put the parentheses. In part two, I discussed five main contemporary theories of hearing and sound, parthood, identity, plurality, abstracta, and property. All of these views allow that some non-sounds appear auditorily. Thus, it is fair to say that since whatever appears auditorily can in principle be sonically pictured, since there is a growing consensus that, contra kivi, some non-sounds can be objects of sonic picturing. Next, I argued that on basis of theoretical parsimony, we should prefer par property to the other candidate views, and I defended property against a well-worn objection from musical listening. In the remainder of this article, I want to explore property's consequence for sonic picturing. Property do doesn't just resist Kivy's restriction, it turns it on its head. According to property, just as colors are properties borne by objects and sometimes events, s sounds are audible, audible quality complexes borne by ordinary noisy events such as collisions. Moreover, just as color bears, collisions are kinds of door slams. Like I, I guess That's what I was thinking, the same thing. Moreover, just as color bearers but not colors are the primary objects of vision, <laughs> ignore everything I say about me, I'm just dumb. Moreover, just as color bearers but not colors are the primary objects of vision, so sound, bearer, so sound bearing events but not sounds are the primary objects of hearing. In this case, then it will typically be just as inappropriate to say that sonic pictures are pictures of sounds as it is to say that visual pictures are pictures of colors. Yeah, I mean, I think this was my, uh, initial problem with the analogy to begin with in some sense getting back to that instead just as visual pictures are canonically pictures of objects so sonic pictures will be pictures of events well some sort of event we have yet to figure out what kind of event of course visual pictures of objects are also de depict visible properties most obviously shape and color but those properties are represented as properties of the represented objects in this respect the representation of the visual properties is secondary or derivative for example, uh, Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait depicts a woman in a green dress. Does it therefore depict a particular shade of green? Yes, but only secondarily, as the color of a particular dress. Similarly, if property is correct, then some sonic, then sonic pictures will necessarily depict the sounds of the event that they represent, but those sounds will be represented only secondarily, as property of their source events. So consider the bird song cadenza in the second movement of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. What does it depict? Property suggests that the primary object of depiction, what a properly formed, informed listener hears in the music, is not merely bird sounds, but a noisy everyday event, birds singing. Does the music also depict bird sounds? Sure, but only secondarily, as the sounds of birds singing. And note that this account matches Beethoven's intention in giving the movement the programmatic title, German words, seen by the brook rather than more German words, sounds of a scene by the brook. Kivy's late paper on musical picturing is entitled Sound in Sound. This is how he thinks sonic pictures work. We hear sounds in sounds. The view I recommend 
differs doubly. When we encounter a sonic picture, what we hear first and foremost is an example and is an event. For example, the playing of a flute. That we experience this event pictorially means that we hear it in another event. For example, the singing of a nightingale. So it's not sound and sound, but event in event. Um okay. I mean I, I think this is a bit of a clumsy way of saying this, but I understand the author wants to uh, parallel Kivy's uh terminology here I mean yeah that's fine I mean you're hearing the singing of a nightingale in the playing of a flute and so you're calling them to events but like I don't know how helpful this is right here um, but it does make for a nice parallel so that's okay here's a nice consequence of this shift when we watch representational films we also perceive events and events more precisely we see worldly events often involving people in projection events on a projection events on a screen I propose that just as we experience the projection event on the, on the screen as moving as a moving visual picture of worldly events, so we experience the amplified playback of the film's audio track as a sonic picture of some of those same events. Thus, we can see in the on-screen projection event, projection event, precisely the same event, a conversation, say, that we hear in the playback of the audio track. Against this, you might insist that our auditory experience in this case is not pictorial. We do not hear in the playback of the audio track the character speaking. Instead, we just hear voices, the sounds of which we involuntarily associate with the visually depicted goings-on in the film. But I find this implausible and untrue to the phenomenology. This is the on-screen visual picture is visibly not a live scene. The playback of the audio track is audibly not a live conversation. Indeed, what Robert Hopkins writes of the visual case is equally true of the auditory case. We seem to see and hear directly neither the events filmed nor the events of the story told. We are always plainly looking at and listening to pictures and so our experience of those events is only ever seeing and hearing them in the visual auditory image before us. Naturally, this view needs further development and defense, but note that it provides a very tidy explanation of why we experience the audio and visual visual components of film presentations to be thoroughly fused. They depict the very same events. Our experience of film is a case of unified simultaneous seeing and hearing in. Um, I guess a, an example just from yesterday, but a general example. It, it is so annoying, so very annoying when the audio and uh, video is not synced up in a video. So, I mean... I know my voice and the pictures are pretty close to synced, and I bet they even do some processing on the uh, side of the like YouTube or Twitch, wherever you're watching this. So if you watch it later, I bet they even do some work to make sure it work, it's synced up. But it is so annoying when those things are like just slightly desynced, and so it looks like uh, things aren't moving. So that sort of uh, experience would show that in that case then your your ears and your eyes are competing for when the event is happening and that wouldn't happen if one was derivative because you just sort of like one would be fundamental and then the other one would just be stupid or it would be derivative but if they're both fundamental at on doing the same thing then the fact that they conflict is a problem so that'd be a nice uh i think that works as an example <coughs> Returning to the case of musical picture and considering one of Kivy's main examples, the 20th century French composer Arthur Honegger wrote a famous piece for orchestra called Pacific 231. A Pacific is a kind of steam railway locomotive, and Honegger's composition represents the sound of the engine starting up, barreling along at top speed, slowing down, and finally coming to a rest. According to Kivy, we hear in the sound of the music the sound of the locomotive. But in contrast, according to property, a performance of Honegger's composition pictorially represents not just the sounds of the locomotive's activity, but also the activity itself. The engine starting up, barreling along at top speed, slowing down, and finally coming to rest. In other words, we hear in one event the performance, and another event the activity of the locomotive. We also, of course, hear in the sounds of the locomotive, hear it in the sounds of the locomotive, but again, only secondarily. We, we amend, similar emendations apply to Kivy's other cases. For instance, in Sound and Sound, he argues that the Dead March in Handel's Saul is a musical picture of a Dead March or a Dead March picture, and is in that sense a musical picture of, a, of musical sound. By contrast, I would describe this as a case where one event, the musical performance of the Dead March in Handel's Saul, pictorially represents another event, the musical performance of an Old Testament funeral march. 
Now, The Dead March in Seoul is a clear case of what Kiri calls aided musical picturing. Without the accompanying text, we'd never know that the performance was meant as a representation. Though it's less clear, Kiri thinks the same is probably true of Honegger's Pacific 231. But if so, he is, is he right that unaided pictorial representation in music, if possible at all, too rare a phenomenon to be counted as belonging to music's repertoire of aesthetic possibilities. No, I think this is a mistake, though. It's understandable given Kivy's focus on Western classical music. Thus, I'll wrap up this section by describing what I take to be two relatively unproblematic cases of unaided musical pictures. Case 1. Beatboxing. Beatboxing is a vocal percussion practice in hip-hop music, so-called because it developed from the desire to imitate beatboxes the first generation of the drum machine. In one of the earliest recorded example, beatbox pioneer Dougie Fresh, the human beatbox, provided a full beatbox accompaniment to MC Ricky D's rap rapped mogul vocals in the song La Di Da Di Da. La Di Da Di. La Di Da Di. Yeah. Since then, beatboxing has developed into an internationally popular, self sustaining musical genre in which artists imitate a wide variety of sounds, musical and non musical, and improvised musical performances. The key point for present purposes is that without any accompanying text, beatbox performances readily provoke hearing in. For example, in the beginning of La Di Da Di, it's nigh impossible not to hear in Dougie Fresh's beatboxing the playing of an early electronic drum machine. The artistry of the beatboxer is precisely to induce vivid and surprising experiences of hearing in without having to tell the audience what to expect. Yeah, but that's kind of like, a, I mean, it's someone trying to imitate a musical instrument which is sort of a uh, meta level thing here so i i think this is a kind of right but it's kind of a little bit of a toy example but let's see what would it but of course you can do other you can like say he was um what's it called the comedian michael winslow when he does those uh other sounds of like i was watching space balls and he does uh, a bunch of like funny sounds with his voice he can imp he, he, he can completely add in like video game sounds uh, or yeah my favorite movies you got uh, Police Academy and uh, Spaceballs but in Police Academy like you see Michael Winslow faking like he's playing a video game um, like and he's making all the sounds but then you see from the other view that the TV is not on and there is no video game there so he's just like faking that there's a video game and so he's he was at that point imitating the sound of the early style video game music the uh 8-bit games or whatever it is in uh the 80s and so in that case i would say as opposed to replicating the music um you yeah, see both of these examples cover songs and beatboxing i think they're right examples but i think you could uh, maybe get some uh because that musical picture was like an old style game and so that was a different sort of picture than these which is a picture of the same sort of thing it's like the music of the music all right so let's get to the second one but yeah <coughs> and if you haven't seen space balls or um police academy in a while go watch it's funny although it, it, these are old movies now i don't know i think space balls will hold up forever i don't think uh police academy will it's got some questionable things in it you could say now but it's still great but yeah space balls will never die I mean, they have a joke about Rocky. Rocky, there's like an, a review of Rocky 5,000. <laughs> like, they're still making Rockies. The joke still holds up now. <sighs> Case 2, cover songs. Magnus et al. offers the following sufficient condition for being a cover. A version of a song is a cover when it is recorded or performed by an artist or a group who did not write and compose the song themselves, and where there is a prior recording which is accepted as canonical or paradigmatic. I propose that in many cases, many and perhaps most cases, covers are unaided musical pictures. Often we can hear the canonical track in the cover, and this constitutes a good bit of our aesthetic interest in it, even if the cover is also independently musically interesting. For example, in listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan's masterful instrumental cover of Jimi Hendrix's Little Wing, we can hear in it both the guitar and vocals of the canonical Hendrix track, and much of the pleasure we take in listening lies in appreciating Vaughan's ability to allow us to do so, even while producing a very different piece of music. 
Moreover, in most cases, properly appreciating a cover aesthetically requires the sort of familiarity with the canonical track that allows you to recognize the cover as a cover without aid of words or of titles, because knowing that it's a cover is not enough. If you cannot hear the canonical version in the cover, that is, if you, all you hear are the cover's surface features, then you are missing out on something aesthetically essential about the work. Despite Kivy's attention to it, musical and more generally sonic picturing has been neglected by philosophers. This is unfortunate, not merely because depiction has become central to the field of philosophical aesthetics. If I'm right, then sonic picturing is both more common and more aesthetically important than Kivy ever allowed. Indeed, appreciating and understanding the possibility of sonic picturing seems critical to understanding a variety of important auditory phenomena, musical and otherwise. Okie doke, this was fun paper. Um... I mostly agree with it, actually, because I just ended up where I wanted it to, so that's always nice. Um, yeah, but again, when it's, I don't have anything like super clever to say because it's outside my area, but let me make it, try and think of something at least to say about the, uh, I like the writing here, too. Um, I thought it was well argued, even if I disagreed with some of the arguments, I thought that it was put together well, and this, I mean... There was, where was it? Yeah, I mean, people always have to show their hand. They always do. Uh, where is it? People always tilt their hand at some, almost always tilt their hand at some point. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to catch it. But why would you quote Heidegger? Just why? You're tilting your hand. Here we go. You have a quote from Heidegger in this thing where we have not been talking about, like, mid-century phenomenology at all. So, it's like right here. Tilt your hand, where is the phenomenology coming from? It's Heideggerian phenomenology. So, and this is what happens when you also have difficulty in, I, I thought this was a difficult argument, and so what do you do? You run back to what you know, the background of philosophy. Um, so I think that's what would happen right there, which is nothing wrong with this paper, really. It's like something everyone does, but I mean, it's just, this is how I just find it interesting. It's like when you have to appeal to the authority, that's what it comes down to. And it doesn't make the argument wrong, it's because this is what everyone does when things get hard. <laughs> uh, um, but other than that, I thought the examples were nice. I mean, I, I came up with some other ones, but that's just me. Um... I mean, not everyone is a, like, Michael Winslow, uh, 80s, uh, comedy fan, movies, and, or other things like that, um, but yeah, I thought this was a well-argued for the, the, the other star, yes, uh, they even put a little table in him, in here, which is nice, you might have had, like, a, uh, third row on the table saying what the your uh, the issue was with each of these like what is the problem although that may have actually been uh, don't do that that's a bad idea i would have seen excessive like here's a table and here's why everyone's wrong so I don't do that um but it is a nice thing to put a uh, visual representation of the uh what's going on in the paper because if you're going to write one of these papers, like where, no, so this is why I think it's a, let me explain why it's a good paper. Because if you can do something like this, where, point this way, like this sort of thing here, where everything is um, in nice sort of like a geometric uh, diagram, then, yeah, there's a different thing going on. Because papers are very linear, you go through it and you have to remember all the stuff. Here you get all the information at once. And so... That way you can actually, it's easier for the argumentation to be understood when you can organize it in this sort of way. I mean, the same reason I like uh, a lot of times logic or uh, is being used in philosophy papers. It's not really because you need to show the logic. It's because you need to give the people something to, for those people who are good at logic, to really sink their teeth into. And so I thought this was a good paper in its examples and in that picture and things like that and how it was organized that it uh, gave a nice reason, a nice way for people to sink their teeth in. Maybe if uh, they have different like backgrounds or, or like me, it's not their area. But I mean, I'm interested in this stuff, but it's not really uh, like I'm not an expert at all in any of this. So um, that's what I have to say about this one. If anyone has any questions out there in the viewership, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll be back on Tuesday. I usually take off Mondays, so today's Sunday, and I'll be back on Tuesday. 
but it was a nice paper. I can see why he might have won. And, uh, well, it was on Peter Kibbe. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it's an American Society for Aesthetics uh, prize-winning essay. So it was a nice paper. All right. Uh, thank you all for listening, and stay safe out there. Have a good night.